welcome to the Dykeman Farmhouse Museum. We're standing on the oldest farmhouse um, on the island of Manhattan. This farmhouse is over 200 years old. It was completed in 1784 by the grandson of our founding father ancestor, John Dykeman, William Dykeman. When he came back uh, after the Revolutionary War, after having fled from uh, upstate, and found that his uh, land and his apple orchards were burned down to the ground. The original farmhouse was located by the East River and 210th Street. But when William came back, him and the family decided to build this house by 204th Street on Kingsbridge Road, then, now Broadway. Please follow me. We're gonna visit now our summer kitchen. The summer kitchen is uh, was the first um, structure built in uh, in this farm. And like many houses at that time, farms like this had two kitchens, a winter kitchen and a summer kitchen for a couple of purposes. Uh, one was to keep the main house, the main structure cold or cool during the spring and the summer uh, seasons. And the other one was to have an alternative space where to do not only the day-to-day -day operations uh, for cooking for the enslaved, the family, and the servants, but to have uh, a space where to store things, where to make butter, make soap from scratch, make candles, um, and things uh, like that. This house, uh, this whole entire farmhouse, was completed in a little over four years, which is certainly a short period of, uh, of time. And it was built with wood and stones um, that were abundant in the, in the area. After William's passing, he passed shortly after completing this farmhouse, the family uh, put the farmhouse uh, on sale. However, William's son, Jacobus, decides to keep the farmhouse for years to come. To my right, there is a smokehouse where the family cured meat. Remember that at that time there was no refrigeration, so meats were cured with uh, salt, and that was the structure where it was done. Follow me please, I'm gonna show you the winter kitchen, one of my favorite spaces. winter kitchen. Um, I'm going to show you why it's uh, such a unique space. Um, the ceilings, as you can see, are pretty low and there's a reason for that. Uh, remember that this farmhouse was uh, built um, shortly after the Revolutionary War, so materials were scarce at that time and using less rock and less wood will have uh, made the construction process much faster. Also, lower uh, ceilings will make this um, space and the entire house uh, heat um, more quickly. Fuel was um, hard to get at that time and it meant uh, time to resource it and money. So these uh, lower ceilings have an important uh, role to play. The ground uh, of this uh, space at that time would have been dirt 
um, these woods, uh, planks of wood were um, installed in the early 20th century when the house became a museum, but uh, they were not here uh, when the farm was operational. The hearth will have uh, been much larger and it will have come probably all the way to the middle of this space to keep the entire house uh, warm through the winter, but also to have enough fuel, enough fire to cook for an entire family, for the servants and for all the enslaved people that work in this household and the, and the farmland. This is a space where the family will have not uh, come to visit at all. This is a space where the enslaved, um, uh, like Hannah, a free black woman who lived in Dykeman, or Francis Cujo, an enslaved uh, black man, will have probably uh, be here either working or interacting. Um, people would have uh, slept here, raised their children uh, here, washed their clothes, hang them probably from these beams. Um, you can imagine how hard that must have been, especially in the hot summer uh, months when New York gets pretty humid. Uh, there was no proper ventilation or cooling system there then. So um, this is, um, and this is a small space, so it must have been uh, quite a work experience to be here day in and day out. Another important factor about temperature, ventilation uh, in the house is this uh, rock um, here, which is a prehistoric rock. And the house was built, uh, keeping in mind to have this rock in it, in purpose. This rock will have been very cool during the summer, helping the rest of the house cool down and very hot during the winter months, warming up the rest of the house. So it's a very, it's an instrumental piece of nature that the Dykemans use as a tool um, for regulating the temperature in the house, which is a pretty ingenious um, way on how to use uh, uh, nature. There's also a very interesting carving uh, on the other side of the, of the rock it's a carving of a board game called Nineman Morris, which predecesses uh, chess. And it's so old, there is a um, Roman uh, poem that dates eight years before Christ that names the, the game. We don't know uh, who carved it. It could have been the revolutionary soldiers stationed in the area, or it could have been the children um, of the Dagman family or the enslaved children. Um, but it's an interesting uh, piece uh, to, to observe. Uh, this area was probably also used as an um, area where to uh, sleep. Um, and this was probably where the enslaved people uh, passed time and slept. So. We cannot talk about um, food without talking about international and local uh, food economies at that time. Uh, during Dutch uh, ruling, um, the Dutch economy relied um, solely and very strongly on the work of the enslaved. The enslaved knew how to, how to cook, how to grow um, food, how to tend the livestock, how to repair houses, how to tend the, the children, make clothing from scratch, make butter, soap, candles. Uh, they will know how to read, how to write, how to do arithmetic, how to play uh, musical instruments. They did everything. Um, we um, Often we are asked, um, what is what the enslaved people ate? And you have to remember that um, most of the enslaved that came to this uh, area of the continent came from West uh, Africa. And Western African diet, it was a very different diet than that of the 
uh, Europeans. The European diet will, at that time would have been corn uh, cakes and puff pastries and meats and a lot of apple cider, uh, while the Western African uh, diet would have been completely different. So the enslaved people at that time in this house and others will have to adjust uh, to their new state of being enslaved. They will have to adjust to um, assimilate to that new culture, uh, learn new languages, and also adjust to a new uh, diet that was completely foreign to them. Uh, who, we're also asked, you know, who um, teaches all of, he ta who taught all of these people how to cook. So, you, you know, in, in the early 1600s, when the first um, ship came from England, uh, bringing approximately 360 enslaved people, you can imagine that one of these people, either a woman or a man, will have known how to cook. And that uh, one person will have to uh, teach others how to, how to cook and how to um, learn new recipes that will cater to the palate of their masters. Um, we know in a farm like this one that uh, cherries, were an important uh, crop. This farmhouse uh, had an orchard of cherries, uh, cherry trees, and apples. Apples um, were a pretty important staple to Dykeman's uh, local economy. Uh, it was definitely worth, uh, worth it for them to buy an apple cider mill. There was an apple cider mill in this uh, land for a while. So they probably, although there are not records, or we haven't found records yet, um, they were probably selling these uh, at the local um, food market. Um, the, if you can imagine the running all of the logistics of a farm like this, this farm originally, or at that time, was 250 acres. It was huge. Uh, and so probably it had like, you know, dozens of people working day in and day out. And somebody had to manage the, the land logistics um, and the household logistics. And that was done by uh, the enslaved people uh, as well. Remember that they knew arithmetic, that they knew accounting, that they spoke different languages. They worked, uh, you know, the house and the land. So... You could say, you know, like, you know, they could have rebelled because they knew how, you know, the farm operated. But remember that punishment, um, whipping specifically, was a reality to the enslaved people in colonial times. So they will have thought, you know, be thinking twice, you know, before doing anything against the, the well-being or the statu quo of the, of the household. Uh, Slavery began uh, in New York in 1626, and it took another 200 years, all, um, 201 years exactly, um, 1827, for it to be abolished. However, it was not completely eradicated until 1840. Hey guys, before I go, uh, I just wanted to introduce you to one of the Dykeman family members. Jacob Dykeman. He was the commissioner of health in New York City in the 1800s and a key player in creating a small school and library in rural New York for the children of the area at that time. Anyhow, I just wanted to say that before I go and please don't forget to follow us on our social media channels, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, dykemanfarmhouse.org. Thank you for watching.